All right, everyone. So today's lecture is going to be on vascular lung conditions. This is one of our last lectures this year. And so we are going to push through, try to get the basics of everything that we need to know and go step by step. Here are your learning objectives for this lecture. And in this lecture, we're really covering three main topics. One, and the most, the one we'll focus most on is pulmonary embolism or PE for short. Then we will cover pulmonary hypertension and a subcategory of that will be core pulmonale. So let's talk about pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is something that you will likely see. Uh, it can be in the outpatient clinic, in the internal medicine clinic, or in ER urgent care. And it is something that we have to recognize because it can be life-threatening. What exactly is a pulmonary embolism? So you have to kind of know your anatomy to be able to understand where PEs come from. I know that in the cardio module you covered DVTs and you can't discuss a pulmonary embolism without discussing DVTs or deep vein thrombosis. They go together, they're hand in hand, one causes the other. So essentially what a PE is, I think you already know, but we're gonna go back to the basics. A PE is a thrombus a clot uh, that starts in usually in the lower extremity, usually starts the lower extremity, and breaks off, travels through the venous system, back up through the inferior vena cava, back into the right side of the heart, as you can see here, back into the right side of the heart, and then travels via the pulmonary arteries out to the lungs. And when those little clots or thrombi, emboli get here, into the lungs, that's when it causes problems. And it causes blockage of blood flow to certain areas. Remember that the blood goes to the alveoli, kind of uh, casts a net over the alveoli in order for gas exchange to take place. In this case, parts of the lung are not receiving blood and so can't get oxygenated and can't uh, send blood to that area. So that's essentially what happens. Um, it's not a good thing in most cases, and not that any disease is good, but these can be serious and life-threatening. So like I mentioned before, you cannot discuss PE without discussing DVT. They go together. So a lower extremity DVT, a PE is a major complication of a DVT. Most pulmonary emboli come from thrombosis in the veins of the lower limbs. We just talked about that. Usually the big ones come from above the knee. Some can arise from below the knee, kind of break off, accumulate in the upper leg or the thigh area, and then travel up. They can also come from deep veins in the pelvis. And then, like we mentioned, calf thrombi, they have a low incidence of traveling to the lungs, but a lot of these times these kind of progress up to the proximal veins and then they have a higher incidence of a PE. Um, it says here, my statistics from your textbook say that for those that have DVTs, 50 to 60% of these patients will develop a pulmonary embolism. That's a lot. That's more than half of people that have DVTs. So this is a common complication of a DVT. And the other thing that was kind of striking to me in my research is that half of these embolic events are asymptomatic. We don't know that we even have them. Now, kind of working our way backwards, approximately 50 to 70% of patients who have symptomatic PEs will have a lower extremity DVT 50 to 70% of the time when evaluated. So that's pretty high statistics. You can just tell by these statistics how closely associated DVT and PE are. Um, you can get DVTs in the upper extremity as well, but they are rare. I, I personally haven't seen a DVT that came or a PE that came from a DVT in the upper limb, but it is more common in IV drug abusers. So what puts you at risk for DVT and PE? Well, essentially, you have the same risk factors for both PE and DVT, so we probably already discussed this in the cardio module, but just as a refresher, there are risk factors, kind of generally speaking, three main things that pose risk for thrombus formation. And that's ca called Virchow's triad. There are three things. One is venous stasis. 
two is injury to the vessel wall, and three is hypercoagulability. So let's talk a little bit about each of these because if you can understand this, then all of the rest of these risk factors, more specific risk factors, tend to fit under those three categories. So when we talk about venous stasis, venous stasis, stasis means static, not moving. Venous stasis, the, the blood in the venous system is under lower pressure and the blood is returning blood back to the heart, okay? And so, especially in the lower limbs, it relies on two things to help get the blood back to the heart. One is a muscular venous pump, meaning that the, ve the veins are housed within the muscles of the lower limb, and every time we contract them, it squeezes the veins and pushes the blood back towards the heart. The other thing that the, vein the venous system relies on are valves. Veins have valves, and those valves prevent backflow of the blood so that it continues in the correct, the right direction up towards the heart. Now, when we have venous stasis, venous stasis means that there's decreased mobility, okay? Uh, decreased mobility within the blood. Blood's not circulating like it should, and that increases with immobility. So folks that are obese, p folks that have had a stroke, that are on bed rest, that are post-operative, all of these are contributing to that venous stasis, which makes you higher risk for a PE or DVT. Uh, we also note that there are lower central venous pressures where you have lower, even lower pressure than usual. So low cardiac output states and pregnancy both also contribute to venous stasis. When we mention injury to the vessel wall, this mainly talks about trauma or surgery or things like that, especially orthopedic surgery put you at higher risk for having a PE or DVT. And lastly, hypercoagulability. And this can be caused by medications like oral contraceptives, hormone replacement therapies for like menopausal women, or, or certain diseases can also cause hypercoagulability, main things being uh, malignancy and surgery, and also some of the more, a little more rare genetic, uh, heritable, hypercoagulable states. And gene, gene defects, those are what we talk about as far as hypercoagulability. So now that we understand that, now we can look at the more specific risk factors. So pretty much with any disease, the risk with age goes up. We Even above 75, for sure, high risk. Above 60, we have to consider that a risk factor. We mentioned malignancy as it poses a hypercoagulable state. Prior history of DVT or PE also puts you at higher risk. These hypercoagulable states like factor, factor V lighting, protein CNS deficiencies, and antithrombin 3 deficiencies are also putting you in a hypercoagulable state. Prolonged immobilization puts you in the venous stasis, long distance travel as well. Important components to ask in the history of someone you suspect to have a PE. Uh, other things, cardiac disease, CHF contribute to venous stasis, obesity, venous stasis, Nephrotic syndrome, major surgery contributes to all of them, and major trauma to injury to vessel wall, and pregnancy and estrogen use, venous stasis, and hypercoagulability. So as you can see here with the risk factors, there are things we're going to want to ask our patient that help clue us in as to whether or not they may have a PE. How do these patients present to the clinic or to the ER? Well, it is notoriously difficult to diagnose a PE you always, always, always have to have it on your differential because it's one of those life-threatening things that if you miss it, the patient can die. So the reason why it's so difficult to diagnose is one, because clinical symptoms depend on the size of the embolus and the patient's pre-existing cardiopulmonary status, meaning that there's a lot of variability in the size of the PE. Small PEs are asymptomatic in most cases, whereas the large ones can be catastrophic, immediate, life-threatening death, okay? So that makes it difficult. And then when you have pre-existing conditions, especially heart and lung conditions on top of the PE, it, it really muddies the water, can make it quite difficult to diagnose. And this is both real world and textbook. And number two, another reason why it's so difficult is that common symptoms and signs of PE are not specific. We've kind of seen that quite a bit within our pull module. We're getting towards the end here. So we have a bigger differential to pull from in our brains, 
And as you can well notice, symptoms of most lung diseases include components of dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, cough, hemoptysis, and then um, signs of a DVT. And that one's probably the, one of the more specific um, symptoms to, to PE. And then if the, if the PE is large enough, you actually get decreased uh, output and that can cause syncope. Okay. As far as signs, things we see on physical exam, we tend to see patients that are tachypnic. You can have rails scattered throughout. Also tachycardia. You can have a, an S4 heart sound, also known as the atrial gallop. That occurs before S1 when the atria contract to force blood into the left ventricle. You can also have an increased P2. And as we remember from cardio, P2 is the second heart sound. It's frequently accentuated in patients with pulmonary hypertension. And this is because the intensity of the P2 is dependent on the velocity of blood cur coursing toward the right ventricle after the ventricular contraction and the suddenness with that, that motion is arrested by the closing valve. So when you have PEs, you have shunting of blood within the lungs, which increases the pressure in the in what is generally considered a low pressure system, the, the arteries of the lungs. We increase the pressure with these blockages and then and thus the right ventricle is having to push a lot harder through that pulmonic valve to get blood out of the heart and into the lungs. And so this can accentuate P2. Um, the big mass of PEs, especially what we term saddle emboli, which straddle the two, pulmonary, the two large pulmonary arteries, these can be catastrophic, can get shock, rapid circulatory collapse, uh, coding, and these happen with large mass of PEs. Most of the time, these patients don't even make it to the ER. They, they kind of, one of those drop dead situations. And other signs are going to be, these are less common, but low grade fever, decreased breath sounds, dullness to percussion. According to up to date, this is the chart they have. It, it's talking about some of the exact same symptoms we just talked about. But the reason why I like this chart is because it, it puts a percentage to it. How frequent are these symptoms? Because I want to kind of put in my head, what am I going to see most often with a PE? And as you can see here, the number one signs and symptoms are noted as the percentage goes up. So the top ones on each chart are the top presenting symptoms and signs that we'll see with patients. You can see that dyspnea or shortness of breath is 73% of patients presenting with that. Tachypnea, 70%. So those are the top two signs symptoms that we'll see. And then they kind of go down this way. As you can see, hemoptysis, pretty low percentage. And circular, circulatory collapse, thankfully, is about 8%. So how do we diagnose PEs? This is what I want to spend the most time on because it's so crucial that we understand how to work up a patient we think might or might not have a PE based on their symptoms and their presentation. Because a PE is very nonspecific, right? We get this dyspnea, a little bit of tachycardia and tachypnea, and it really, it doesn't, it can mi mimic or mirror a lot of other processes. We have to calculate a pretest probability. How likely is it that our patient actually has a PE? And we use one of two systems. They're both the same system with different scores. Uh, most commonly, I've seen use the Wells score. There's also a modified Wells score, and I believe we talked about this in cardio, so this is more of a review, but very important to understand. What we do is we take these, these points that have been researched and we quantify clinical risk. How likely is our patient to have a PE? Okay. And when we take these signs and symptoms, we plug them in, we add point values to them, we're able to separate patients into low, intermediate, and high risk probability groups in the Wells classification. And with the modified Wells, we divide them into two groups, PE likely or PE unlikely. And it's really, really important that you know these. I would definitely commit these to memory. It makes sense if you think about it. If you understand how PEs present and what causes them, you'll, this makes perfect sense. And I have a chart on the next page that's going to help us think through it, okay? All right, so let's start with Wells criteria. Wells criteria, remember we said, divides up patients into three main risk groups. Low, 
risk of having a PE, intermediate risk, and high risk. And, un and understanding and classifying these patients helps determine what we're going to do. How are we going to work with these patients? Because as we've seen, and as you will see when you're out in the clinics, patients present with shortness of breath all the time. And if we did a CT angiogram on every single patient that came in with shortness of breath, it would have a lot of unnecessary radiation. And that is why it's just so important to uh, classify these patients ahead of time, figure out how likely it is that they'll have it. So these are the same things that we just saw here. These are assigned point values. Same things that we see here, just a different chart. So what are the major factors that, we're, that we are adding up to come up with this pretest probability score? One, signs and symptoms of DVT. That's assigned three points, and this is DVT, not PE, DVT. So if we have leg swelling, redness, positive Homan sign, pain to the lower limb, uh, one, one lower limb is larger than the other, that patient gets three points, okay? Next, we're looking at the ult, if an alternative diagnosis is less likely than PE. So that means is, is PE top of your differential? Does, does the history and physical exam point you towards PE? Okay, if it is PE close to the top or at the top of your differential, the patient gets three more points. Okay, next we assess the heart rate. If the, this is very objective, so it's easy to, to classify. Is it greater than 100? If it's greater than 100, patient gets 1.5 more points. Next, immobilization. Have they been immobilized for any reason more than three days? This would be due to travel, bed rest for pregnancy, surgery, uh, any of those Get, you get another 1.5 points. Next off, has the patient ever had a previous DVT or PE? If so, another 1.5 points. Does the patient report hemoptysis or did you see hemoptysis as they presented? That's another point. And last but not least, malignancy. So that's either current malignancy within the past six months or if they're on palliative care for, uh, for malignant condition. That is one point. So we add these points together then we come over to this algorithm and we place the we place the patient in a in a risk category so if we have two or less than two excuse me less than two uh, points then the patient can be assigned a low risk classification if the patient has two to six points on these uh, factors they are determined to be an intermediate patient. And if they have greater than six, then they would be considered high risk, high pretest probability of having a PE. So let's start over here on the low end. This is gonna be someone that comes in with a little bit of shortness of breath, but they really don't have a lot of the signs and symptoms that make you think PE. And so when we have this low pretest probability, less than two, then we use a second set of criteria called the PERC criteria, okay? The PERC criteria are what we use in low-risk patients to help rule out the patient for PE by physical exam and history alone, meaning we don't get the D-dimer, we don't get a CT, we try to rule them out by history first. And this is very important because if we did a D-dimer on every single person that came in with dyspnea or shortness of breath with cough, we would, and we know that D-dimer is nonspecific, we'd have a lot of patients that rule in and have to have imaging, and that's not good. We can, we can rule out a lot of patients with just this information. How the PERC criteria works is you have to look at the patient and figure out if all of these are negative. So is the patient less than 50 years? Yes. Is the heart rate less than 100? Yes. Is their oxygen saturation greater than 95? Yes and so on. No hemoptysis, no estrogen use. Essentially, they have zero risk factors for having a PE or DVT. If you can answer all of these as they, they, are, they fall in this category, then it's considered negative and you can move on to, to no workup for PE. Now, we might have to work them up for something else, but for PE, that's the end of the road. You can rule them out with PERT criteria. Now, if any of these are positive, even just one, then we cannot rule them out with PERT criteria and we have to, we have to do the D-dimer, okay? If they fall in the intermediate category, we do the D-dimer 
two to six, we do the D-dimer first. If, it, if the D-dimer comes out to be less than 500, it's considered a negative D-dimer and no imaging is indicated for PE. If it's greater than 500, we have to move on and get some imaging. Last but not least, if you have a high pretest probability, chances are we're thinking, man, I think this patient really does have a PE. You can actually bypass the D-dimer if they have six or more uh, points on the well score and go straight to imaging. Hopefully this makes sense. I tried to get a nice simple algorithm that was easy to follow, at least here initially, so we can understand it. The next slide is a bit more complicated, but I don't think it's as, as complicated if you understand this slide. So if you don't understand this slide, look through it again, process it one more time, then we move on to the next slide. All right, so I think we got this. We moved on to this slide. And essentially what this slide is, is it, it further lays out each of these pathways. So low, intermediate, and high. And each has its own mini algorithm. Okay, so this one right here is a evaluation of a non-pregnant with low probability, right? Low probability, low probability. And it's the same as what we saw before. Uh, we apply the PERT criteria, right? The same as before, PERT criteria. Can we rule them out with PERT criteria? If so, then we're done. No further testing. If we can't, then we get the D-dimer. If it's less than 500, we're good. If it's more than 500, we get the CTA. It's what they like to call it, CT, CTA. Um, can we get the CTA is the next question. And as you can see here, is it feasible? Feasibility is over here. The patient has to be able to lie flat. You have to be able to cooperate with breath holding instructions and they have to actually fit into the scanner. Most CTs are closed, uh, circular closed cylinders. So you have to be thin enough to do that. You also have to be able to have contrast administered. So if you have kidney disease or have a BUN and creatinine that's too high, uh, most times you cannot have the CT. But that's certainly the, the next step right here, CTA. If you have any contraindications or, or it's not feasible for you, you can move on to having a VQ scan. Same thing here. If the CTA is inconclusive, we move on to the VQ scan. Now, VQ scan also has feasibility requirements. Feasibility requirements require that a chest X-ray is negative. Has to be clear or else you can't get accurate results with the VQ scan. And the patient has to be able to lie still for 30 minutes. If it's feasible, we have the VQ scan done. And VQ scans are only helpful if they show normal or if they show positive. Okay, anything in between can make it very, very difficult, okay? And if it's normal, completely normal, or low probability result, you can exclude PE this way. If not, if you can't have it or if it's indeterminate, then we have to proceed with more testing. And I know it's quite a long algorithm, but the other testing we would consider here is a venous Doppler. That's usually the next step after this, but I don't expect to get this far down. Up to about here, I think we're good. Everything above here it should be easy to understand. And remember, this is again for low probability. This is that left side. This is this side right here is what we're talking about. Okay. If we move over to intermediate, now we're at a well score of two to six. We, for, we forget the PERT criteria. We cannot use it for this. We, step, we start with a D-dimer, and again, it kind of mirrors this part. If it's less than 500, we're good. If it's greater than 500, we are moving on to CTA if, if they can tolerate it, and then if not, VQ, and then if not, further tested warranted. And that's the same. This is the same as this, right? This is the same as this, so it makes sense, right? It's just without the perk step, okay? Last but not least, high probability. So this is the well scores of six or more. You, you can skip straight to the CT, skip straight to the CT. Can they have a CT? Yes, we get the CTA. Can, if they can't or if it's inconclusive, we get the VQ and then we move on. So the, other, the only thing with this is that 
you have to consider the VQ scan a little bit more, right? You have to continue for further testing here if there's an intermediate or low probability that it is, okay? High probability, we diagnose it. Low probability, normal, we exclude it, okay? And then there's the further tests. I hope this makes sense. It's just kind of reinforcing this more simplified chart. I think it's still simple. It's just a few more steps involved, okay? All right, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, this is the modified Wells criteria. And the reason why I put this on here is I just wanted to show you that it's essentially the same thing. It's the same set of criteria, but for the modified Wells, instead of having one, two, three categories, we have two. And it's either PE unlikely, which is a uh, four or less, or I'm sorry, less than four, sorry, less than four, or it's a greater than four is likely. So we've essentially cut out the middleman. And instead of it being less than two, two to six, and greater than six, we have only two categories. And you can use whichever you want. I tend to use the, the regular, regular old Wells criteria, but just know that both exist and they both work off the same factors. All right, and if you were going to use this modified Wells criteria, PERC would be considered here if your risk score is less than two, same as in the other algorithm. And that's why I tend to use the other one better because that low risk group runs through the PERC score automatically. And here you have to kind of think about it. Cool? Awesome. So let's look at the PERC score again. I use this on a daily basis in the ER because so many patients come in with shortness of breath. And like I said, if, if you don't rule them out by this, then you're going to be doing a lot of unnecessary D-dimers and potentially a lot of unnecessary imaging. All right. It is rule out criteria. Okay. You do not use this on someone that you think has a PE. It has to be someone with very low risk, two or less points on the well score for PE. And I have a little mnemonic here. It's breaths helps you remember the different criteria. Um, you have to be, this is actually age less. Let's see. You know, that's right. Correct. Sorry about that. So if you have blood, man, you can't do perk. If you have a uh, rube air less than 95, then you can't do perk. If you use estrogen, you can't do perk. If you're greater than 50, you can't be ruled out. If you have a history of DVT or PE, you can't do perk. If your heart rate's greater than 100, nope. And if you've had surgery in the past four weeks, no perk. So there's a lot of reasons why you can't use perk. If any one of these is positive, then you cannot use perk. You cannot use perk. Okay. Move on to the D-dimer. All right. Hopefully this makes sense. So going into a little bit more about the different diagnostic imaging, we saw the algorithms. We saw when we would do them. I just want to talk just a little bit more about them because I don't want us to get confused. Okay. So let's start with chest x-ray. We use chest x-ray in almost every patient that we see in the ER with any sort of thorax type chief complaint, right? Especially uh, shortness of breath, certainly would get a chest x-ray as a first line um, assessment tool. Now, chest x-rays are not gen diagnostic for a PE. It does not establish it by itself, but it helps us exclude a lot of other common, common lung diseases. So chest x-ray can be normal. It says, according to research, about 12% of patients have a normal X chest x-ray, even with the PE. Okay. Most frequently findings that they see are atelectasis, some little infiltrates and pleural effusions. Uncommon findings, but findings that are common on testing are these two signs, water Westermark sign and Hampton's hump. And so Westermark sign, what we see over here is this prominent central pulmonary artery with local ole, ole, oligemia, oligemia, can't pronounce that. But essentially what that is, is you see this is prominent in here. And then right here, you see that there's decreased lung markings. So it's blocked that those vessels that usually come out, you can see them over here are blocked. So you get this kind of dead space here, no blood running through that area. 
That's Western Mark sign. It is not common, okay? Uh, we don't see it very often, and if you see it, you're lucky that you get to see it. You're probably still getting the CT, okay? Hampton's hump is this area of opacity that represents this interprinkimal hemorrhage. And so you usually get them kind of here on the side. It's like this little humpty hump over here, and it suggests hemorrhage, okay? Um, one other thing that we use chest x-ray for is these patients tend to come in pretty significantly dysmic, right, and hypoxic. And so when we think of patients that are, you know, severely hypoxic and dysmic, we think I, I'm bound to see something on chest x-ray. But in the majority of the time, we don't see anything on chest x-ray. And that's kind of setting off something in our head like, wait a minute, this chest x-ray is normal, but this patient looks horrible. Maybe it's a PE. All right, CTA. CTA has become the North American gold standard. And I say North American because we have modern medicine here. Probably other modern countries have it as their gold standard as well. What we consider as a gold standard is the best definitive diagnostic test for any specific um, disease. And he, there's different names for it. It can be called a helical computed to tomography, pulmonary angiography, or CTPA. Where I come from, at least in my ER, we tend to call it CTAs or CT angiograms, okay? And it, it has really high sensitivity and specificity, so we use it all the time. And recent studies show that greater than 90% sensitive and specific, and that's in the low to intermediate groups. In the high uh, high clinical probability groups greater than 96%. So that's really good. Um, it's really going to help us. It, can it be 100% diagnostic? No. So you have, still have to use your clinical judgment. Uh, but most of the time it's going to be accurate. It's going to tell us what we need to know. Basically what it does is we get a CT. It's a radi radio radiological imaging. We inject dye. Dye goes through the artery, venous system, arterial system. And when there's a blockage, the, the contrast can't get past the blockage. So you get uh, imaging of vessels, especially like here, where there's emboli blocking the transmission of that contrast through the vessel. And that's what we're looking for. Or that's what the radiologist is looking for. I don't usually read CTs for my patient. Okay. Uh, some of the drawbacks or some of the things you have to consider uh, is, the like we mentioned, patient has to lie flat. They have to be able to cooperate with breathing breath holding exercises uh, and they have to be small enough they can't be so overweight that they don't fit one last thing you have to use IV contrast it does not work without IV contrast and so if you have someone with severe kidney disease usually like diabetic things like that they cannot have CTAs done it does have some radiation exposure as well that you have to consider and like we mentioned it's not 100% definitive to exclude PE but we use it all the time. This is has become the gold standard. Historically speaking, we've had a different gold standard, which I'll mention in a bit. Next up is the VQ scan or the ventilation perfusion scan. And what is what it's done is a nuclear medicine uh, imaging study. They give um, they give a medication that tends to light up. It binds to things, lights up. They do a ventilation study. And in the ventilation study, you see that everything, that the lungs are ventilating well. There's no blockage. And that's why the chest x-ray has to be normal. Because if there's problems at all with other things, then it won't work. It'll show abnormalities. We see the perfusion, which is blood flow to the thing. You see these, these points where there is less uh, uptake right here. And those are places that are suggestive of PEs. Okay, don't need to get too into, into it, but really one thing I want to mention is that VQ scans are great when they're normal or when they are high probability of PE. Those VQ studies that are kind of indeterminate or in the middle, we can't really tell if it is or if it isn't, are not too helpful. Okay, the patient does have to stay still, lie down still for... 30 to 60 minutes for a VQ scan. So you can imagine patients with like severe COPD or CHF or other things that don't allow them to lay flat are probably not going to be able to tolerate this type of procedure. Next up 
ultrasound with Doppler. We saw this in the cardio module when we talk about DVT because it is the test of choice to detect DVTs. Now this is not just any, any old ultrasound, this is ultrasound with Doppler. Doppler looks for blood flow, okay? And up to 70% of patients with a PE will have a DVT. We talked about that at the very beginning. So this is not first line for detecting a PE. But because there's such a correlation between DVT and PE, if we have a patient that sounds like they have a PE, they can't tolerate the other procedures or they're inconclusive, we can come down, look for the DVT, and that helps us uh, di make the diagnosis. And essentially what we're looking for is compressibility of the veins. And you can see here this one flattens from the probe, but this does not. And you're pushing on it with the probe, so that usually indicates a, uh, a thrombus. The good thing about ultrasound is it's not invasive, it uses no radiation, but the other thing is that it is user dependent. So you do have to have someone working the ultrasound Doppler machine that is able to read them well. And I think most most ultrasound techs are pretty good with, uh, with limbs. Uh, it's not as challenging or complicated as say abdominal ultrasounds. All right, last but not least, is pulmonary angiography. Do not get this confused with the CT angiogram. All right, don't get confused. This is a CT. Pulmonary angiography is a procedure. So essentially what we do is we get a catheter, we run it up through a vein, it's a procedure, right? Run it up through, uh, put it into the heart and inject dye, you inject dye, and that lights up all of the, the vessels, the arterial vessels here, and we're looking for blockages. See, all, all these are nice and filled, and this one right here kind of cuts off, that's for what you're looking for. These used to be historically the gold standard, and just because something is a gold standard doesn't mean we always do it. Okay, and I'll give you an example. What's the gold standard for Alzheimer's disease? Let you think about it for a second. The gold standard for diagnosing Alzheimer's is autopsy. And I imagine that to make the diagnosis of a patient with Alzheimer's, you're certainly not going to wait till they die to cut their brain open and look, right? So that's kind of how I think of what gold standards are. They are the most definitive way to make the diagnosis, the most accurate, but they're not always feasible. So historically, pulmonary angiography was the gold standard for this, and maybe some still consider it the gold standard because it is considered one of the more accurate ways of detecting a PE, although it's been replaced by the CT version, okay? Some of the things, we hardly ever use these anymore, but when we do, we can use it for catheter-directed therapy, meaning we stick a catheter up and we give a thrombolytic or we give, uh, or we mechanically remove a thrombus and that can be done in more life-threatening cases of PE and then we also do it occasionally for those that have chronic thromboembolic disease with pulmonary hypertension okay all right so how do we treat it we've been talking for a long time PE is a big topic um, how do we treat it we treat it with acute anticoagulation therapy and for the means of ICM if I ask you what the mainstay of treatment is for PE, you can just say anticoagulation. That's going to be the answer, okay? I'm not going to ask you, well, should we do a DOAC? Should we do unfractionated heparin or a low molecular weight? That's farm, okay? Um, one thing I want to mention is if you have a high clinical suspicion, so those with the well score of greater than six, you think, wow, this is probably a PE, you give the treatment. You don't wait for the result. And there are some algorithms that help guide when to initiate therapy, especially for those intermediate risk type patients. It usually has to do with how quick you can have access to getting confirmatory diagnosis like CT. Um, if you ha are in a rural center that doesn't have CT and it's going to be more than four hours before you can make the diagnosis, many, uh, many experts recommend that you do initiate anticoagulation. If you have a high risk or high probability, initiate the anticoagulation. The bottom line is you don't just blindly wait for studies to confirm, okay? Um, there are some 
the the DOACs are becoming the recommended first line. These are the newer direct acting oral anticoagulants. This includes like uh, Pradaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis. Um, it have to be uh, patients that are able to take that. Uh, otherwise, we usually do a, a combination of a heparin or a low, low molecular weight heparin uh, in addition to a warfarin, and we do a transition over to oral warfarin, dis discharge them home, and then have them onto their, their INR. And these patients tend to stay on treatment depending on their risk factors for, for having uh, a VTE, which is another term for PE, venous thromboembolism. And so most of the time for general patients that have low, low risk can be continued, discontinued after about three months. The others are more prolonged. Other more like life-saving type threat, uh, treatments are going to be these two. One is thrombolytic therapy. This is like your TPA. This is like what we give for those strokes, right? Of course, we have to consider guidelines. We cannot give it uh, for patients that have bleeding or anything like that. We have to meet the guidelines. Uh, and we only give it for high-risk massive PE, so people that are hemodynamically unstable with low risk of bleeding. And then uh, you can give it, usually that's just administered, then you also have the catheter-directed thrombolysis, which we talked about. Um, last but not least here, mechanical embolectomies is surgery. They go in and remove it and usually do this in patients that cannot have thrombolysis and that are having failure of or failure of thrombolysis. It's kind of last ditch efforts to save someone. Okay, we don't do this routinely either of these. As more of a preventative measure, uh, we we can do an inferior vena cava filter, and this should be in patients that have contraindications to anticoagulation, right, or those that have recurrent PEs. And essentially, they put in this little net. It looks kind of like this. This little net that catches the clots as they go up the leg, okay? Um, and then it must be, and they, they put it in the inferior vena cava. So you have the iliacs, common iliacs coming in, dumping here. They put it here so that the clots can't make it from the leg all the way up to the heart and the lungs. We try to remove these at the earliest opportunity. Some patients have to have it long-term. Here's some algorithms to help you assess when to initiate anticoagulation. I don't necessarily expect you to know this for my test, but it is nice to see the algorithm for treatment. Here's those IVC filters. Have it up here, IVC filter. Looks like this little net catches the big clots, keeps them from going to the heart and to the lungs. When should we admit PE? Well, I would say that most patients with PE require hospitalizations. You can carefully select patients with low risk that can be safely managed as outpatients with the, those direct acting anti, uh, anticoagulants. And you have to pick the right patient because patients have to be able to take care of themselves. They have to be able to rely on them for close follow-up. So anyone that falls in these categories, they have se severe illness, comorbidities, they, they have lack of knowledge, or they have poor compliance. You do not want to send these patients home. You keep them inpatient. And I'd say vast majority are going to fall into the admission category. Last but not least, the prognosis of a PE. So it causes more than 50,000 to 100,000 deaths. This is annually within the United States. Uh, remember, we mentioned that a lot of these are silent. A lot of PEs are silent. We don't know that they're having them. And they tend to recur. Um, what we see is that most of the time when a PE is diagnosed, the mortality is about 10%, and usually that's within the first 60 minutes, those big catastrophic PEs. Of those who survive the initial event, approximately 30% of these will die of a recurrent PE if left untreated. That's why it's so important that we make the diagnosis and we treat them uh, to try to prevent. Okay. Any questions on PE? If you do, shoot me an email. Right now, I'm going to take a quick break to ask you some questions, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 
right, so next up, we're going to talk pretty briefly about pulmonary hypertension. Certainly much less uh, intense conversation than we had about pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary hypertension, let's take a look. Pulmonary hypertension is a problem by uh, pathologic elevation in pulmonary arterial pressure. Now, normal artery pressure, the system within the lungs is a low pressure system. And normal pulmonary artery pressure at rest is between 15 to 30 with a mean pressure between 10 and 18. And so what that means is under low pressures, there's easy diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide from the capillary to the alveoli and vice versa. That's what we want. We want lungs to be under a low pressure system. Kind of what we talked about earlier is due to certain diseases, whether it be pulmonary or otherwise, you have an increased pressure within the pulmonary arterial system. And pulmonary hypertension is defined, the definition is a mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than or equal to 20 millimeters of mercury at a resting cardiac catheterization, okay? It used to be 25, but now it's 20. So we have to remember that number. We get this through a right heart catheterization, and that's how we get the pressure. Uh, essentially, it increased pressure, because remember, normal was 10 to 18. We'll talk about this a little more. I don't want to get too much into the pathophys, uh, because obviously we want to keep some distinction between ICM and pathophys, but I think it's important to understand how it happens. Just like I mentioned before, I like to get my pen out. Let's get my pen. Pulmonary circulation is a low pressure, low resistance system, okay? And it can accommodate significant increase in blood flow, right? Especially like during exercise. But during pulmonary hypertension, there's an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance and it increases the pulmonary systolic pressure. So high pressure, um, the heart's having to pump against higher pressure in the pulmonary system. And there's a bunch of different causes. We're going to try to cover them at a glance. Uh, the WHO classification system of pulmonary hypertension, I think it's pretty easy to, to group things. I like grouping things in my head. I feel like I remember them a lot better. So we need to remember these five groups. Okay, Group one is going to be primary pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this is an innate disease. This is a disease that causes increased pulmonary arterial pressure. And that is what is termed PAH. We'll talk about it a little more in a sec. Group two are going to be caused by left heart disease. Remember, the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. Uh, this is the kind of heart disease we talked about in the cardio module. Now, group three are going to be the ones that we talk about the most. And these are the cases of pulmonary hypertension that are due to chronic lung disease or hypoxemia. So these are going to be mainly COPD and restrictive lung diseases, uh, interstitial lung diseases. Group four, we also going to talk about quite a bit because it has to do with thromboembolic events. So just what, what we just talked about, PEs, and these are the more chronic type PEs, the little ones that kind of plug it up over time and cause chronic elevation in the pulmonary uh, arterial pressure. Group five is kind of the hodgepodge group, kind of the multifactorial mechanism group, and we'll go into that a little bit more. But you should rem remember these groups, just generally speaking. Here's kind of a diagram or picture illustration of the different groups. We said group one was pulmonary arterial hypertension, a PAH. It's idiopathic, and we'll talk about that a little more in a sec. Mm, group two is going to be here. And that's due to the heart. So group two is a heart problem. Group three, lung problem, pointing to the lungs. Uh, group four is going to be PEs. Okay. And group five is all the extra stuff. So we have hematologic, systemic, metabolic, and others. And we'll go into a little more depth. So group one. Group one is primary or pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this one is idiopathic, it's familial, it's a vaso-occlusive disease, and it, it, it's its own thing. It's its own thing. And you get an abnormal increase in pulmonary arterial resistance. 
Okay, so you get uh, pulmonary hypertension and it leads to further wall thickening. It just, it's a mean cycle, okay? And so this is what it looks like. A nice pul healthy pulmonary artery, nice and clear. Uh, when you get hypertrophy or, or over uh, veno-occlusive disease, you start getting encroaching of the, the vessel walls to where it constricts down so much that you have increased pressure in that system. It's kind of like putting your finger over a water hose, how the water comes out a lot more vicious, a lot more with a lot more force. And so that's essentially what it is, except it's instead of putting your finger on the hose, it's squeezing down the hose so that the water's coming out faster with more pressure. It, we don't know what the cause is. It's idiopathic, um, but it usually affects young to middle-aged women. And it doesn't have a very good prognosis. Mean survival is two to three years. There are some newer medications that are given for this. Uh, it's one of the few that has an actual treatment for it. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, just a little bit in, in a couple slides. Group two are going to be your heart disease. So pretty much anything that causes the left heart failure will then back up and cause increased um, pressure in the pulmonary system and these are some of the main players. We just covered this in cardio, we're not going to go into depth now. Like we said, group three are going to be the ones we focus on almost the most. COPD is the most common, most common cause. You also have some obstructive sleep apnea, chronic hyperoxemia, any type of restrictive obstructive pattern and interstitial lung disease which we just talked about. In this process, uh, you have problems within the alveoli, right? Problems where they start collapsing. The body's mechanism for, for dealing with alveoli that aren't really conductive to diffusion of oxygen is to clamp down the blood supply around that alveoli. When you clamp down the blood supply on that alveoli, it shunts blood to other parts of the lung. When you have widespread alveolar collapse, you have problems overall in the lungs, like most of these chronic conditions do, it keeps collapsing and collapsing vessels all over the lungs, all over the lungs, till before you know it, it's it's clamped down the entire system, and that increases the pressure, which backs up blood to the heart, the right side of the heart, and that leads to core pulmonale, which we'll cover in a little bit. Group four are going to be your chronic thromboembolic disease, so PE, chronic PEs, uh, recurrent PEs. And then group five is going to be your miscellaneous. Like we said, there's hematologic disorders, hemolytic anemia, myeloproliferative disorders, and splen splenectomy. There's also systemic things like sarcoidosis, neurofibromatosis, and vasculitis, and some other diseases, tumor obstructions, uh, chronic renal failure, and such. It's kind of uh, the catch-all group. So what are the clinical features of pulmonary hypertension? Well, Unfortunately, kind of like PE, there are no specific symptoms. Uh, it really delays diagnosis because early on, pulmonary hypertension is silent. Until it starts causing problems, um, then, then it starts usually causing some right heart failure, and that's when we start to notice it. Uh, really, what you should do is look for pulmonary hypertension in those patients that have these chronic conditions that tend to cause it. So how do they present... Again, dyspnea on exertion, who, what doesn't present with dyspnea on exertion? It seems like almost everything does. Uh, Non-productive cough, fatigue, chest pain, which is usually exertional, and also syncope, which is exertional, and that's with severe disease. Kind of sounds similar to, um, to severe PEs and such, right? Uh, what we tend to hear is this loud second heart sound, kind of similar to PEs, right? We said... They get the pulmonic shutting, and sometimes that's the only sign that we might see, right? And the patient may still have pretty devastating disease. You also start, once you start having chronic pulmonary hypertension, it starts back, uh, backing up the blood and ca causing right heart failure. Then you start getting the symptoms of right ventricular heart failure, which are JVD, hepatomegaly, ascites, peripheral edema, si symptoms and signs of right heart failure. So there is, we love classifying things. There is a clinical severity classification system for pulmonary hypertension. And it is uh, modified by the, the WHO. 
and it mainly deals with symptoms and functional status. So class one is the most benign. There's no limitation of physical activity, no dyspnea, fatigue. So essentially um, asymptomatic, right? Asymptomatic, but they still have pulmonary hypertension. Class two, next step up, slight limitation in physical activity, no symptoms at rest, but you, get, you do get some exertional symptoms. Class three, you start having marked limitation of physical activity. You still don't have many symptoms at rest, but less than ordinary activity causes these symptoms. And last but not least, the most severe class will be inability to perform physical activity without symptoms, and everything is present at rest and with activity. It's just the worst. Okay. I don't necessarily need you to memorize this, but it is important when we think about you know, treatment and things like that. Um, for the most part, patients with pulmonary hypertension are going to be treated in specialty facilities. It won't be something, it'd be something that you refer for and maybe monitor, but it's treated in facilities that are equipped to treat pulmonary hypertension. One of the main things we need to do is to determine the cause of pulmonary hypertension. I just showed you five huge groups of, of things that can cause it. Uh, most of the time, the clinical picture, the comorbidities will point you in the right direction. But if you have to figure out what's causing it, it for instance, if it's a younger female that has uh, PAH, you have to rule out everything else to be able to diagnose that as PAH. So you get routine blood work, although it's often normal. You can get a BMP looking for heart failure, for like left heart failure, CHF. Um, it should also be evaluated for HIV, liver dysfunction, connected tissue disorders. You get EKGs. Usually they're normal. In advanced disease, it'll show some right ventricular hypertrophy, which we understand is because of the increased pressure. And right atrial enlargement in later uh, stages, right, from the, from the um, failure. You also get chest x-rays, CT scans. Uh, they can sometimes notice enlarged pulmonary arteries as they dilate because they're pushing against uh, a lot more pressure, a higher pressure system. Um, we also check PFTs. That's going to help us uh, rule in or out pulmonary disease in the group three category. Uh, echoes, it's the best screening study. One, because it helps us rule in or out uh, left heart failure or CHF as a cause, but it also tells you how advanced it is in relation to how dilated the pulmonary arteries are and the dilation or hypertrophy of the right side of the heart, which is leading more towards core pulmonale, right? Uh, what else do we want to know? Uh, we're also going to look at the interventricular septum, okay? Uh, Right-sided cardiac catheterization is going to be the gold standard for diagnosis, okay? And that is how we get that MPAC, mean pulmonary artery pressure, of greater than or equal to 20. We get that from doing this catheterization. It's a procedure. You send a catheter into the heart, you would, and you measure pressures, okay? Um, ABGs help look for hypoxia and other things. Serologies help in, in diagnosing like connective tissue disorders and things that can cause pulmonary hypertension aside from lung and heart problems. Um, really what we do a lot of this for all these testing is to try to recognize whether it's heart disease or lung disease as the cause of pulmonary hypertension. And if that's not revealed, we also can do a VQ scan, which helps us look for PEs. Okay. And last but not least, PAH group one, in the WHO classification are going to be a diagnosis of exclusion. Awesome. How do we treat pulmonary uh, hypertension? Obviously, because there's so many different causes, one specific treatment plan is not going to be feasible. There's so many different causes and each one requires tailored treatment. If the pulmonary hypertension is secondary to another disease, like recurrent PEs, should be treated. So anticoagulation, uh, more chronic anticoagulation, things like that. If if uh, you have the group one or uh, PAH, there are some newer vasoactive agents that have helped with this. Uh, there's some new trials that have been done, and they might lower the pressure resistance and help 
uh, help prevent further disease. Remember, the, the patients historically had a pretty poor prognosis. Um, these work primarily for group one. They don't work for other types of pulmonary hypertension. A lot of these patients are going to require home oxygen, uh, diuretics, and occasionally things like digoxin. And we talked about this long-term anticoagulants for group four and lung transplantations if medical therapy is no longer effective. What's the prognosis? Well, it really depends on what group you're in. The prognosis of PAH, it's improved. Remember we said it wasn't very good, but with the, the new medications, the vasoactive medications, it has improved. Uh, those that have more poor prognosis are going to be pretty pretty uh, self-explanatory. Older patients, unfortunately males, have a worse prognosis. Those functional classes, remember we had uh, several functional classes depending on the, how it affects their daily life and the kind of symptoms they have. The ones in the two top classes are going to be obviously a more poor prognosis. Um, failure to improve to a lower functional class with therapy or right ventricular dysfunction. Once it progresses to that, it's, it's poor prognosis. And that leads us into core pulmonale. So core pulmonale is a sequela of pulmonary hypertension. And I really like this diagram. It helps us see the, the mechanism or the pathway of how this happens. So COPD is the most common cause of group three pulmonary hypertension right? And it is the most common cause of core pulmonale. So core pulmonale is essentially right heart failure due to pulmonary hypertension from a pulmonary cause, okay? And so what we have, remember we said we have clamping down or vasoconstriction and hypertrophy of the, the system within the, the lungs. And so with that, you get vascular remodelization, and you get increased pulmonary artery pressure. This is pulmonary hypertension, right? Greater than 20 or greater than or equal to 20. And what that does is it increases the right ventricular afterload. So the blood backs up in the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart is having to pump harder against the higher pressure system, which leads to hypertrophy and then starts leading to failure. So first hypertrophy, then dilation. And that backs up the blood up through the vena cavas and out to the systemic system that causes the signs and symptoms of right heart failure, including uh, hepatomegaly, right, the liver. It also causes ascites because of that. And it causes peripheral edema. And last but not least, it causes... Help me out. Other signs of right heart failure. Having trouble remembering. We'll get to it. All right, so right ventricular hypertrophy, right heart failure, secondary to pulmonary disease. So it's not related to heart disease. It is only related to pulmonary disease. Okay. So essentially we have a lung problem. Right heart can't pump blood into the lungs. So we get pulmonary hypertension, and we get right-sided heart failure, then we get JVD, that was the last one I could not remember. JVD, lower limb or limb edema, and liver distension. So that's kind of the one thing leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to end game, which is core pulmonale. Causes, like we said, it, it has to be related to the lungs. It has to be a lung problem, not a heart problem, okay? has to be a lung problem. Uh, other causes, said most common is COPD. Other causes, recurrent PE, so that's a group four on the pulmonary hypertension. And then the other group, th th group three items, which are interstitial lung disease, obstructive problems, cystic fibrosis, and obstructive sleep apnea. Clinical features going to be kind of the same things we saw in pulmonary hypertension, decreased exercise tolerance, cyanosis, clubbing, and signs of right heart failure that we talked about, hepatomegaly, edema, JVD. You also get the parasternal lift uh, and the pulmonic, the P2 sound like we did before. 
How do we diagnose it? Pretty much the same way we're diagnosing pulmonary hypertension. Chest x-ray, we'll see enlargement of the, the right atria, right ventricle, pulmonary arteries. Uh, e EKG, we're going to see the same things, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy. And echo, we're going to see right ventricular dilation, but normal left ventricular size because it's not due to left-sided heart failure. That helps us exclude that as well. How do we treat it? Well, we have to treat the underlying pulmonary disorder. Same thing with pulmonary hypertension. Uh, these patients often require long-term oxygen therapy if they are hypoxic, which most become hypoxic at some point. Uh, we, like we mentioned before, we can give inotropic agents like digoxin. And uh, vasodilators have been studied, but they don't tend to help in pulmonary. These vasodilators tend to help in the group one, which is the pulmonary artery, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension, the group one patients. And really that's it. So as far as knowing and learning, um, as far as knowing and learning pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonary, I think I highlighted the things I find most uh, that you need to know the most. Pulmonary, uh, pul sorry, <laughs> I can't talk anymore. Uh, that means I should probably stop here. PEs, you need to know it all. The only thing that I might not, that I won't test you on are specific medication doses for treatment. That'll be fun. But otherwise, you have to know everything about it that I mentioned. Um, pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonary, keep it more simple. All right. So hope you enjoyed this lecture. I know it was kind of a long one for only three topics, but we're getting near the end. So push through. Uh, here's a few questions before you go, and I'll see you in class.